Good morning, this is Ellen coming to you from the beautiful island of St. Bart's. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, this is Stan coming to you from the stunning swamps of Gainesville, Florida. And today, our special guest on Light Talk is award-winning lighting designer Rick Fisher. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers... And sister. That's right, Ellen. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to episode 391. We have a really great show today because we have Rick Fisher with us from London. But before we get started, we just want to remind everyone to check out last week's show, episode 390, where we had Dennis Size on, and he talks about uh, all the lighting he did for the that great debate that we watched last week. And uh, he was the light designer for that and some great stories. So if you haven't checked it out, check it out. But let's get started. And today we have Rick Fisher. So Ellen, you want to tell our listeners a little bit about Rick? I'd love to. For any of you who don't know Rick Fisher, he is an American lighting designer who has been living in London since the 1980s and working in the U.S., U.K., and internationally on a wide range of theater, dance, and opera projects, including Broadway, The West End, and more than 20 productions for Santa Fe Opera. His work in dance includes the mostly incredible Matthew Bourne Swan Lake in London, Los Angeles, and on Broadway. Awards include the Bronze Medal for Lighting Design at the 2005 World Stage Design Show in Toronto, Olivier Award for Best Lighting Design in 1998 and again in 1994, and two Tony Awards, one for the Broadway production of An Inspector Calls in 1994, and a second in 2008 for Billy Elliot, the musical, which is now celebrating its 20th anniversary and probably still running someplace in the world. Rick also received the Enrico Caironi Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2017 Knights of Illumination. He is a fellow of the Association of Lighting Designers and was LDI's Theater Lighting Designer of the Year in 2008. The funny thing is, Rick and I grew up about five miles apart in suburban Philadelphia, but did not meet until after he had moved to London. And it was sort of a weird thing. We were doing a 30 under 30 roundup for lighting dimensions. And we had a writer named Adriana in England. And I said, so if you run into any designers, see if you can get them lined up. So she walks up to Rick at a party and says, are you under 30? He says, no. <laughs> and she says, oh, forget it, and walks away. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, How to feel over the hill. Oh, my God. <laughs> what a diss, man. What a diss. But yeah. I was living in France at the time, and Rick was in London, and I made quick, a lot of quick trips over there to see his wonderful work, including um, An Inspector Calls, which is really an extraordinary production in which the lighting really is a main character. And, of course, Swan Lake, uh, which uh, Matthew Bourne's all-male version was quite exceptional and really groundbreaking at the time. And... So to my fellow Philadelphian, welcome to Light Talk. Thank you, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be part of this. Oh my God, Rick, I, we've been waiting so long for you to be on the show. I think it's been eight years, right? Yeah, it's been, we just never quite made it, made a date. <laughs> right. He's the busiest man in showbiz, I'm telling you. He's the mm, busiest light not designer so sure I know. About that, but I, <laughs> I keep, I'm, I'm still going. I'm just pleased to still be going. Yes, and you're doing incredible work and you continue with the amazing work you've done earlier in your career too. So that's awesome. I saw Billy Elliot years ago and I must tell you that was one of the best Broadway musicals I've ever seen. I saw it in London. That was yours, Yeah, I saw it in London too. I saw it in London London as well. Yeah, Yeah. it's pretty great. I mean, what's I'm proud about Billy because it doesn't really look like a musical most of the time. Yeah, yeah. And that seemed to suit that particular piece. Right. In fact, probably the best, the bits of of the show that I'm least happy with are the bits that should look a little bit more like a musical, if you know what I mean. But it, yeah, yeah, but it has a, it has a lot of depth to it, right? Yeah. yeah, and just incredible artistic touch to it. Thank you. It was a it was a lot of work to make it, and it's currently running in Tokyo as we speak. Ah, okay. In English? <laughs> in no, in Japanese. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as as what happens in in that market is they'll take West End and Broadway shows, they'll run them for three months, they'll rehearse them, stage them properly, full the original production, run them for three months, and then they put them away. Hmm. 
And then three years later, they bring them out again for another three months. Interesting. We're usually recruiting most of the same actors to come back and do the show. A little bit trickier when you've got kids in the show because they <laughs> age and get older. Nice, nice. But uh, we, this is our third time in Tokyo. So how many Billies do you think there have been in the past 20 years? Somebody knows, <laughs> not me. I've not met many of them. But um, the production also, as happens with these musicals, the production is also licensed to other companies and non-original productions. Mm. But uh, we've had something like 30 or 40 at least in, the, in our original production, some of whom have gone on to great things. Wow. As dancers? Well, no, as actors and dancers. Um, most, our most famous Billy is arguably a little Spider-Man called Tom Holland. Oh, right. It was a Billy in London. Mm. Wow, that's great. Well, Rick that's and I have known great. each other for, what, about 15 years now, I think? Yeah. 15, 20? Mm -hmm. And I've, we've been following each other's career. <laughs> Rarely in the same place at the same we're time. We're never in the same Almost place never. at the same time. I mean, there was one time, I think I met you at Santa Fe, and I think that was probably yeah. the only time we met in person. But yeah, that I was, think so. That was pretty awesome. So I think you were working Central City at the time. That's right. Yeah. The work you've done in Santa Fe that I've seen is just amazing. Oh, well, uh, it's a beautiful, it is, you know, it's people always say, oh, where's your most favorite place to work? And it's like trying to choose between your children sometimes. <laughs> but uh, Santa Fe, because you get the gift of nature as well. Right. And it's just extraordinary with an amazing, always an amazing team of people. And when it works in Santa Fe, it's just the best. Yeah. I'm yeah. pleased to say I'm going back there in 25. No, oh, great. Wow, great. To take a production of Rigoletto, oh, Rigoletto that we're about to make in Dublin in the autumn this year. Excellent, excellent. You know, I, what Rick just said about, for anyone who doesn't know, the theater in Santa Fe, when he just said, a, you know, a taste of nature, um, not only is it in one of the most beautiful settings anywhere, but the whole back of the theater opens. So if it's left open for the performance, you can actually see the sunset. Um, yeah, as you can part see the sunset, you can see lightning, on. you can see yeah. rain. You can see the twinkling lights of Los Alamos and hopefully nothing blowing up in Los Alamos. <laughs> Not a mushroom cloud in the distance. Right, for Dr. Atomic, that would be perfect. <laughs> what an idea. <laughs> I've sadly once seen fires on the, oh, on, the, sad, yeah. on, the on the mountains oh, 30 miles away. Wow. You can see the, the, the forest burning. Wow. Mm. It is so, a beautiful uh, spot. It is, it is gorgeous. And it's it open is. on the sides as well, so you... Feel air, wind, rain, cold, right. everything. Yeah. I think the last time I saw you there was that year we did the live design backstage tour and you had done La Boheme. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne yeah. had redone that very silly Cosi Fantuti. Right. You know, it's interesting also, that just we're talking about Santa Fe, there are a lot of very young uh, student technicians that go there. You know, because it's somewhat of a training ground too. It's a yeah. fantastic it, training. Isn't ground. that great? I mean, imagine being yeah. being a young a young lighting assistant or whatever, and getting to work with Rick Fisher or some of the other great. Well, great all designers. of you. I mean, have you, David? Have you done something? I was I was supposed to do five shows there, and I've had to turn all of them down because I had it's other. A shame. Oh, it's a shame. It was other because yeah. I had other commitments, but yeah. I've I've been there quite a bit because I've seen yeah. shows. I've seen your shows there. I've seen yeah. a lot of shows there. And, yeah. uh, uh, no, they're they're a, a real plug for their apprentice program. Unbelievable! It is, it is a brilliant training. Um, you don't have to think that you like opera to do it. A lot mm -hmm. of people come from programs all around the United States and occasionally from abroad. Um, they look after you well. They pay you for your work, which is also a nice, rare event sometimes when you're training. And they've got a great staff there, and it's just about the best place to work in the world. And you don't have to go anywhere around opera in the United States. You don't just scratch the surface, and there's always a Santa Fe person there. Because <laughs> they do a similar training, not only to the singers, but they do a similar training in all areas backstage, right. which they take very seriously. Right. And it's a great place to be. And I would urge anybody listening to consider applying for a, a summer role there. Absolutely. We've been sending students there for years, including recently, yeah. even last summer. We I'm worked, sure I've worked with a few of them. Yeah, they worked their way up from an intern all the way to being a, you know, a supervisor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. 
So let's get yeah. started. Stan, you have our first question for Rick today. Well, since we covered some of Rick's hi- uh, headlines, let's take them back a little bit. When you were a small lad in Philadelphia and you didn't have any idea about this stuff you could do with lumens, the question I certainly is, didn't. what took you into this lighting design career in the first place? I'm, uh, I'm largely an untrained lighting designer. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom used to take us to see shows in Summerstock in the Philadelphia area, occasionally into the city to see something, some children's theater occasionally a little thing. I just looked at the stage and thought, this is so glamorous. How exciting. I remember seeing a production of South Pacific in a tent, maybe at Valley Forge, maybe I probably at Valley Forge Music Theater it used to be. It was an, a tent with a circular stage. And so the actors used to all have to run up and down the aisles to get to the stage. And I and there were kids in the show and I looked at the kids and I remember looking backstage, being able to see just out the back at the top of the aisle, and the kids were playing ball with one of the lead actors. And I looked at those kids and thought, gosh, they must be having such a good time. <laughs> and thought, well, this is the, that's the life I would like to have. So um, rolling forward, you know, I auditioned for plays and musicals at high school. And if I got cast, I was usually the third person to the left. Maybe sometimes the last person on the left. <laughs> sometimes I was on the right, but that was about, I never got very close to the center. Um, slowly but surely, but I, you know, enjoyed doing that. It was always fun to be part of the shows, but I didn't consider it a proper job. Uh, went to college in Dickinson College, which is a small liberal arts pl- uh, college in central Pennsylvania where there was a theater major, but it was very much about reading plays and theater kind of as a hobby as opposed to something serious that you could do as a profession. But again, I joined the theater program there. I joined the little student-run musical thing and was in a few shows, but always, I mean, I literally was a spear carrier. And um, so, but you, in order to ingratiate yourself, you did a little bit of work backstage. And I found that I enjoyed the camaraderie of being backstage more than I enjoyed the rejection of being on stage. (laughs) Uh, So in my summers, I threw myself at summer theaters where I worked as a slave. Um, In my first job was in Atlantic City in a shortly lived summer theater before there was casino gambling in Atlantic City. One of the hotels trying to drum up some business, let out their theater space to a cheapskate producer uh, (laughs) who got us all to work for very little money, but Mm. I was in heaven. And I admired the people backstage a lot. Mm. And I found that I really admired the set designer and the lighting technician who was a force of nature is perhaps the politest word I could Mm. use for her. And, uh, Loved hearing their stories about what they were doing in New York and stuff like that. So I worked there for a summer. And then in my sophomore and junior years, I went to work at, in Philadelphia at a now defunct, also formerly tent theater in the round called Playouts in the Park. that used to run weekly summer stock shows starring famous stars of yesteryear. <laughs> Uh, take touring around and doing the straw hat circuit, as they used to call it. Sometimes musical, sometimes plays. One year I was an apprentice, which meant that we did everything. And so I did a, a week in the wardrobe. I did a week in the box office. I did a week for lighting. I did a week with props and a week building scenery. And we did whatever was required. And I remember on the lighting calls thinking, this is impossible because there are all these numbers that people keep saying all these numbers. What do these numbers mean? How could anybody remember what all these numbers mean? But there was a very patient lighting designer called Jeffrey Schistler. who was their season lighting designer. He worked a lot in the 70s, doing off-Broadway stuff. And he was very patient. And I used to focus lights for him. And I found that after I focused one or two lights, I kind of knew what the next light was going to do. And I do have a memory of that. I was still mystified by all the gel numbers. Um... But I really admired the stage managers. So I decided as I was going through college that I wanted to be a stage manager when I grew up. Roll forward to um, my 
first semester of my senior year, I came to London on a, a student exchange program, like a lot of American students do, and was going to study further my stage management training. Did a little bit of that in London, but met some people in London and was able to work backstage at a couple of theaters in London and felt that after when I went back home and was rather obnoxious going back to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, after having lived in the big city of London for a while where everything was so much better and the theater was so exciting that I decided to come back to London and try my hand and work my contacts in London for a few months in 1976, which is the year I graduated college and the year I moved to London. And I've been working those contacts pretty hard for what's nearly 50 years. Wow. 50 years. Um, wow. <laughs> that's know, like, awesome. How did that happen? Yeah. How did that happen? It's, it's so and, ridiculous. Um, you know, you never know. Yeah. Right? And I did everything backstage and I became a resident technician at a little, what we call a fringe theater, which is what you would call an off, off Broadway theater. Mm. And this was a little theater that had two spaces, the big theater seated 130. The small theater seated about 60 if you squeezed people in. And I was the sole technician in charge of these spaces. And they were experimental spaces where people would sometimes just bring a touring show in. But a lot of small, radical, we're talking the 70s, uh, <laughs> companies started their political companies doing political theater. There was a lot of uh, performance art happening there and non-narrative or non-written shows and there was a lot of what i used to call ist theater like activist theater there was feminist theater there was black activist theater there was gay activist theater it was a very fertile place and with different people all around we had rehearsal rooms so we were truly a wonderful space and it was all run as a collective and so i got very involved in that for two years and a lot of companies would come and say we're making this show but we don't we need some help with the lighting and so they would tell me, they would sit me down in the coffee bar that was part of the theater complex, and they would ex describe their shows to me. There was no script because often they weren't written down, but they would often describe their shows in images. So it's going to be an image of somebody walking through the door. Then there's an image of a group of people doing something. Then there's an image of this. Then there's an image of that. And there's an image of that. And I would be taking down notes and trying to get what moods and what things they were talking about. And I would go lock myself in the theater at night and I would rig our 40 conventional lights because it was well before any automation or any, any electronics entered our lives. And I would rig lights for them. And I would go to a box with all the bits of gel left over from whatever productions had passed through. And I'd hold up gel to the light and say, that's a nice color. I'll put it in. And, uh, I think what I came to realize is that I was giving myself a self-taught lesson in how to tell story with lights because we didn't have a lot of lights. So you, I very rarely drew a plan. I did it all by instinct. I will also share with your listeners that I'm still pretty horrible at drawing plans. <laughs> and it is the one thing I hate the most. Me uh, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I will do them. anything. <laughs> then confront the blank piece of paper. <laughs> I still draw by hand. Wow. And uh, I have stencils. No, they yeah, don't make those still anymore. still doing it that way. Look at this. And, <laughs> yeah. And I hang on to them. I get people to sure. give me their old ones. Oh, there you go. I mean, a lot of, t you know, and uh, I draw, and I draw little maps. And I just share this with your, some of your listeners because I think everyone's taught to do CAD so much. I was going to see if I could show you. I think I just recycled my last one, uh, which is what good because it's embarrassing. Yeah. Just to say, you know, because it's about communication. And I will now pay somebody, I pay a young thing to draw them up for me if I need to. Doing some of the projects I do and for the amount that I'm getting paid, I say, you're going to get a hand drawn plan. If you want to draw it up, that's your business. But here's the information we're a lot less paperwork oriented in the UK than you are in the US. But um, that's a little bit of a diversion. But anyway, so I, was, I found myself telling stories with all these fringe companies. Uh, and I worked at the Oval for two very formative years. We're talking the very end of the 70s. Then I decided to upgrade myself and get a proper job as a stage manager 
at a small fringe theater in London called The Bush, which was a room above a pub that seated 140 people. And The Bush had a group of three stage managers, and you all, and you were the technicians of the, the small theater. You had to build the scenery, you had to get the props, you had to do the laundry, you had to uh, tear the tickets, run the show, everything. And, uh, and it, they took it on a rotating turn that you would light the show. And some of the people coming through the bush were people I'd worked with at the Oval, so they would ask me to light the show. So I'd got some credits as lighting designer there, although I still saw myself as a stage manager. Mm. and indeed became a British equity stage manager at that time. Realized that stage management wasn't quite as creative as doing all the nutty stuff I was doing at the Oval. So I went freelance in 1980, uh, and I always say that's a polite term for unemployed. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been freelance ever since. So the Bush Theater was really my last full-time salaried job. And I continued to find that I was mostly getting offered work, rigging lights, working for theater companies, helping out with props, doing a bit of everything. But slowly but surely, my lighting ability with some of the little fringe companies many of whom i met at the oval they would we would we would make a show together where i'd be in rehearsals every day doing the stage management skills doing the prop get a gathering skills collecting all the stuff running the shows making the sound tapes wasn't very good at that but uh, all that stuff and then they came to the point of well rick how do you want to be billed and i looked at other theater programs and if you look for a stage manager, well, you have to look for a stage manager's billing. It's all the way in the back in tiny little print, <laughs> even in your playbills on Broadway. To find this, unless you're, you now build on the front page if you're the PSM. But the stage managers were all buried in small print. It may not surprise you that I'm not a small print person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've seen your jackets, by the way. They are fantastic. This man has the most amazing jackets in the world. That's all I have to say. I've also had another one of my mantras is you, you do wear loud clothing. That's right. <laughs> because you want people to notice you. And you want people to come up and say, who are you? What did you do? But because you can get away with it. You, you can get away with it. Not many. I can yeah. get away with it. You can. Yes, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. It took me a while to realize I didn't have to wear black anymore. Ah, okay. You know, there's that's, I think those of us who are designers who have come up through the ranks as being technicians, right. you know, black was our go-to look. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so anyway, I was working with these companies. They said, how do you want to be billed? And I looked at the credits and there was the, there was the author, there was the director, there was the set designer who often did the costumes. And then there was the lighting designer. So I thought if I call myself the lighting designer, cause I've done <laughs> the lighting, I get on the front page. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So I called myself a lighting designer, and some people were foolish enough to think that I was one. <laughs> yeah, right. That's great. And I've been fooling them ever since. That's a great well, trajectory. Well, you've been fooling mm. them brilliantly in dance, yeah. opera, <laughs> and theater. A successful imposter. <laughs> yeah. How do you move so fluidly from them, between them? Do you have a preference, and is your design process the same? Um. I think one of the things that we're lucky with in the UK compared to what I perceive of the American market by and large is that it's much easier for us to move between genres here. There's a lot more crossover between the directors and the designers who do some opera, do some theater. Dance, you tend to get a bit more pigeonholed and you just do dance. And I must admit, I've done some dance, but I don't do very much dance. I'm not someone who people naturally think of for doing a dance project. Um, I like working with music, which is a great pleasure. I love, I mean, I fell in love with musicals as a teenager in America, going to see shows. Um, musicals were what I would really go to see. In fact, I remember going to my first Broadway play and kind of being surprised that there was no orchestra there. I hadn't quite put two and two together. Um, so I like work. I like working with opera, but I don't think I'd like to be only an opera de designer. So I, I can follow music. I was encouraged to have piano lessons as a kid. I sang in the choir in high school. I was never really good. I can follow a score without being able to read it, if that makes sense. Yes. 
and that's helpful. Um, this is sort of an aside, but as an American, did you have trouble working in England when you first started? Yes. Yes. Um, I came to Britain when there was a lot of unemployment, one of the very peak periods of unemployment, basically in the depressed years before Mrs. Thatcher was voted into right. power. I never had trouble getting work, though. So I, was, I had jobs where they would apply for permits for me. And eventually, by sticking around long enough, I was able to get sorted out. Oh, that's good. But it's, uh, it's not easy. And even today? Even today, it's pretty hard. You can get, you can come in as a visiting designer. So I'm sure that either Stan or David was coming to do a show at the Opera House. They would sort out a working visa for you. And they do have visas for people that they consider of exceptional talent. And we're not as restrictive, I think, in the UK as even the American system is perceived to be. It won't be your perception being based in the States, but to a British person, there's this whole idea that, oh, you can't work on Broadway if you're not part of the union and if you're not, you know, part of the, the Broadway mafia. I know that for a fact is not true. But that is kind of the perception. Whereas Britain is never, we don't have a strong lighting design union here. We are members of British Actors Equity. Uh, so we're along with the stage managers and the actors and the scenic costume designers. But we're a very small speck on Equity's uh, radar. So they don't do very much for us. And they're not very much not exclusive. They would never ban anybody from coming to work here. Although, interestingly, you have the uh, Association of Lighting Designers, which we don't have in America. Yeah, and that's, it is now, we, um, it's something I've been involved with for a very long time, originally called the Association of Lighting Designers. It's now called the Association for Lighting Production and Design. Oh. We decided that we wanted to, we changed the, the initials to the ALPD. Okay. As I'm sure... All of us will acknowledge lighting is not about some designer having some brilliant conception and throwing your conception onto the stage. We don't do anything anymore without a team of brilliant people working with us. Programmers, technicians, suppliers, manufacturers. And we wanted to bring the people who are working in all aspects of entertainment and live performance lighting into our organization because we all share many common concerns, joys, and frustrations. So we put production at the heart of our title. Very interesting. That's, that's nice. really, that's that's very really nice. ahead of us. Yeah, that's yeah. really thoughtful. Yeah. We, and, it's, and I want to stress that it is a professional organization. Mm. So we are a friendly association. We have different categories for professional working members. We have a, an affiliate category, which is for people who have an interest in lighting or might do there are a lot of people in the UK who do a lot of lighting and are completely passionate about it, but don't choose to do it for a career. Mm. We'll do lighting design for amateur, which is a very broad and active amateur uh, theater scene in the United Kingdom. So some of those people are affiliate or people who work for companies uh, can be an affiliate member. We also have a very active student group. So again, of bringing people into the business who are studying lighting or studying any aspect of lighting, who study programming or being who want to be technicians, lighting technicians, uh, maintenance, lighting maintenance people, wow. and it's we're not a union, but we are. We do share information. We have events. We have an excellent magazine called Focus, and uh, we ha are here to support each other. Sometimes in very private support when you're frustrated and having a bad time. We can be the Lighting Designers Anonymous on the other end of the panel <laughs> yeah. to talk people down after a bad day of tech. Can I call you, Rick? I really <laughs> need to call you sometimes. It sounds so inclusive. <laughs> I love it. Are well, that's what our aim is. Our aim is to be that. And it's uh, and it's and it started out over 50 years ago. I think we're nearly wow. 60 years old now. And it started out really as a lunch club between a group of gentlemen, because it was gentlemen, many of whom were reasonably well healed and had and lighting was their hobby but it was also their passion so they used to meet together two or three times and have a very nice boozy lunch at a very harsh restaurant in london they opened themselves up to and indeed they used to include scenic designers 
and it was originally the Society for Theater Design. And then the two groups realized that they had to move into two separate organizations because they're specific interests. They did include honorary members were people like Theron Musser and Joe Melziner. Mm-hmm. And they would have, you know, if any of them were coming over to the UK to do a show, they would make sure there was a nice lunch in their honor. Nice. But it started out as a friendly, caring association. And I think that has been the bedrock of our industry, which I would like to say in the UK is much less competitive and much more supportive and friendly than I sometimes perceive the United States to be. You know, you go to wonderful things like LDI and you get all the lighting community together and everyone says, oh, this is so much fun. Why don't we do it more often? And that's what the ALPD is there to try and do. Now, and I've been very active involved. I'm, I was chair of it for 14 or 15 years. You were executive um, vice president. I'm on the website. I'm still, I'm still vice president. And um, I, it's not been officially announced yet, but our president for a long time was our founder, Richard Pilbrow. Wow. Who right. Exemplified the community of lighting people. Right. Uh, and lived that community throughout his entire 90 years of mm-hmm. life. And he passed away just over a year ago. And I think I'm going to try and succeed and fill his rather Whoa. large shoes of being oh, president of the LD. It's more of an honorary role than a practical role. At the moment, our very brilliant chair is a uh, talented lighting designer, Joanna Town. Oh, I love her. And she does great work. And she has, you know, I'm just, my jaw is dropped open by what she has done. And my goal with the ALPD, what it was the ALD, was to make sure that we got most of the working lighting designers involved in it. Because I thought if we can get the people who are doing all the shows, the 20% who do 80% of the work, if we got them involved in it, it would be interest of interest all our other members and i worked at that and uh and we figured out things that would make it worthwhile for people to be a member we have a database of what people get paid forget the union minimums because we all know that union minimum lighting is lights on and lights off (laughs) and if you want anything extra honey you're going to pay for it But, uh, and so we share information about that. We share information about, you know, suggested things to have in people's contracts. So we do a lot of stuff that we have a lot of documents and a good website. It's a great website. I'm looking at it. I just bookmarked it. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and again, we always have a sense that we could be doing more, but it's run by working lighting people. We do pay for a part-time administrator who keeps us going. And uh, it's a great resource and encourage people to check out the website. And if you want to join as an affiliate member, you get a copy of our fabulous magazine, Focus, <laughs> which is really great. Because we don't talk about gear. We talk about what we do. That sounds great. Rick, so really cool. uh, non-British people can join this. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Very awesome. cool. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We, again, when I joined, you had to fill in a little mini resume <laughs> and... We don't bother with that anymore. Well, you could vouch for me, can't you? Can't vouch for anybody. <laughs> the idea is we want to be, we, as you say, we want to be inclusive. We want to have people who are yeah, interested in Yeah, it's very cool. Can you, can you awesome. uh, link a little Light Talk connection to the membership? Yeah, we should do that. I will make a note of that. You also have your own backstage charity. Yeah, that uh, is another thing that I was involved in helping to kickstart. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, ironically, a good friend and colleague of mine, who uh, was an inspirational lighting designer, who did a lot of the fringe work that I started out doing. And I used to try and do his relights, which was never easy because he was too good for me, um, had a terrible problem. His wife, he, he moved abroad and was living in Spain, and his wife got very, very ill unexpectedly. It turned out that there was a congenital illness history in her family, and that most of her relatives died at age 35 because it was something that their brains just went to much horrible you, you sort of i don't remember the name of it um, they used to call it mad cow disease which was one thing that happened and then but there's a human variant that they suffered from and so our line designer colleague had to stop working for a while and look after the family and look after her during her final months 
And a brilliant man called Tony Gatelier, who Ellen knew well, yep. who was a what we call a boffin in the UK, but basically a genius inventor who looked at something that needed to happen and then went into his garage and figured out a way to build something to make it happen, I think is a fair description of him. Yep. Uh, he was a brilliant innovator and also a very good journalist and writer about our industry. And Tony was a great friend of Tom's. And so he organized the way you do a little bit of a whip round among our friends saying, oh, if you can pitch in a bit of money, we'll just get it to Tom so he, he can just keep going. And Tony and I started talking and he said, Tony, and it was Tony's idea, said, maybe we should make this a bit more official. Everybody in our business is freelance. Nobody has insurance in this country. We're blessed with the National Health Service, so health costs are not the issue they are in the United States necessarily, but things fall off the edges of the health service and other things happen. So Tony had the brainchild and he talked to me because I was chair of the ALD at the time. And he said, Rick, could you help us with this? And so I got involved and we created a charity which I named Light Relief. And Light Relief was set up to be a charity for people in the lighting industry. And we raised money in various ways. We got donations from individuals. Again, as we know, there's a fabulous community of lighting manufacturers and users all around the world who, when they heard about it, you know, kicked in a bit of money. And, uh, and I also set up something which I now know is being replicated a little bit in the United States. For a while, we did Light Relief Day. And we asked all those people who had long-running shows in the West End or Broadway or around the world who might be getting a royalty from them to ring fence one day of royalties to give to the charity as just a way of giving back. And so we raised some money that day. It wasn't didn't matter if you didn't have a show running that day, you know. But you'd say, okay, yeah, I I've, I've been lucky this year. Here's a little something. So we ran light relief for a while, and then. Um, we started to feel that maybe it was too narrow, uh, or many people felt that it was too narrowly focused. And this was at the, t the, the interesting time when Plaza, which is our trade organization in the UK, decided to merge with ESTA, which is the trade organization in the United States. And we, we got some people involved uh, who thought that we should maybe create a charity that worked in both countries for this newly more merged organization. So we rewrote the terms and we created behind the scenes. So we had behind the scenes USA and behind the scenes in the UK. So I'd like to think that Light Relief encouraged behind the scenes to be set up. And as we all know, behind the scenes has done fantastic work in the United States and continues to do such. And it's much more professionally run perhaps than our charity ever dreamed of being because your needs are also very different in a bigger country. And particularly when you have to face healthcare costs. Um, when the divorce between Esther and Plaza happened, like in all good relationships, certain things had to change. And so it was felt that we should change our names because we didn't want people getting confused between the two charities and behind the scenes had gotten so established in the United States. So it gave us a chance to relook at ourselves in the UK and rededicated ourselves to our mission, which is to help almost anybody working in live entertainment backstage as opposed to on stage or in the pit. There are other great charities that help musicians. There are a lot of great charities to help performers in all areas, but we still help not only lighting people, but sound technicians, video people, even if you're on the road catering on a, you know, on a band tour, you know, we've helped people doing that. Like behind the scenes, uh, in the U.S., we did a lot during the pandemic and raised some money by various events, and we're able to create a hardship fund just to give people a little bit of money to get going. So we're now called Backup Tech, and Backup Tech is our industry charity. We are one of the recognized charities by Plaza, and uh, we help a lot of people. And so it's a great, and I'm still a trustee of that. I've been involved in that now for over 20 years, and that's 
part of the reason why I got my Lifetime Achievement Award. I hope it wasn't just for my lighting. And mm. usually you give somebody a Lifetime Achievement Award is because you want them to stop. <laughs> or you think they <laughs> stop. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it's already. really for, uh, <laughs> But I think it was really because I've been an active spokesperson for the charity, which is the industry helping ourselves. Nice. That's and beautiful. Which is great. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. beautiful. That's, and, that's awesome. And it's interesting that we're now finding that we're often giving people sessions of counseling to help them cope mm. with the stress of oh freelance life. Mm, yeah. uh, and it's interesting how, so at the, you know, we still help people who have a partner unexpectedly die or get sick oh. and all of a sudden have to mm. concentrate on the family. We still help people who have get injured. Uh, it's very gratifying. And anybody who would like to support Backup Tech by donation, we're very grateful. And we completely understand if you're American People want to support behind the scenes, which I would encourage you to do. We because do, yeah. It's, um, we got to look out for each other. Mm -hmm. We know the stresses and the strains of this life, which we most of us would not change for a sack of gold. Right. Maybe a pink sack. <laughs> I was hoping that sack is. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a way of us supporting each other. Yeah. And it's not, we can't give life-changing amounts of money. But it's a way of saying, we see you, we know you, we've been there, and for the grace of God, we're all there, and we're here for you. Wonderful. So, you know, your, fee your fees are that. very nominal. I'm looking at the, yeah. the fee structure to join. 60 euros for me as an affiliate. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, we, that's again, great. that's the ALPD. We, we're not trying to be. We only yeah. just need to cover our expenses. Right. Right. Beautiful. That's uh, you'll be getting my yeah. uh, application soon. <laughs> please, please, yeah, yeah. So, so I have a question. You were talking about, you know, yeah. your lifetime achievement award. I, I think, uh, you know, that's you know, bravo on that, obviously. Um, Thank you. But you also got the Knights of Illumination Award, mm -hmm. and every time we have a guest who's gotten the Knights of Illumination Award, we ask them the same question. Now, how did you get that sword from <laughs> when you got it? Back to London. They ship it. Okay. okay. They ship it. There's only they one at LDI. Oh. Everybody gets yeah. the same oh, one. Oh, that's the same and one. Same, and same in London, too, because when they brought in that award, <laughs> which no longer exists, uh, when they brought in that award, it was just a time when, you know, we don't have the gun violence, thank God, that you do in the United States, but we do have knife crime. Mm. And it was about the time when there was just a spate of knife crime, and so the organizers said, Oh my God! You're not going to go home on the tube with a sword, are you? Because we have a ceremony in London. <laughs> this whole system was, and I can talk a little bit about the Knights of Illumination. Uh, and indeed, we now have a successor, new award, given out for the first time this year in the summer, which I hope you know about, called the Profile Awards. Right. We wrote yeah. about and them they, on Live Design. Thank great. you, Darren Marenghi. You, yeah. So Darren Marenghi was the person who came up with the idea of the Knights of Illumination Award 15 or so years ago. He was doing some consulting for our great manufacturer, Clay Packy, in Italy. And Clay Packy wanted to show their interest, particularly in the theater market, which they respected a lot. And at that time, their equipment was maybe a bit more known for rock and roll and events. And they were really trying to move into the theater market so that Darren was trying to make some introductions, and he suggested that they sponsor an award, and they wanted the ALD, as we were known at the time, to give out these awards to the best lighting design. Now, imagine a friendly organization of colleagues, not competitors, giving out awards to the best lighting design. How quickly do you think we would all lose friends uh. and influence <laughs> with each other? So we brainstormed about this idea for a little bit, and collectively we came up with a brilliant extension of something that we were doing in our Focus magazine. We used to get a theater critic to write a column for Focus to talk about the lighting that they had seen. Because as we all know, most theater criticism anywhere in the world barely mentions what we do. And if they do mention what they do, we do, it's usually with one of their stock 20 adjectives, of which they rarely get past seven. <laughs> oh, sharp lighting, effective lighting, <laughs> evocative lighting, dark lighting. Dramatic lighting. Dramatic lighting, <laughs> not very good lighting. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I couldn't see so, anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, we had the idea of expanding on that, and we threw a good friend of mine who was a 
a freelance theater critic working for various newspapers, we decided to appoint a panel of theater critics, two from the dance world, two from the opera world, two from the theater world, to come together. We paid them a small stipend. I mean, we're talking a couple hundred bucks. And we gave them a good lunch. And we said, you don't have to do anything extra apart from think about lighting when you watch the shows, make some notes during the year. Anything that you see is eligible. Anything that you don't see is sadly not eligible. And we invited them to come together. And over the course of the year, we probably have had 30 or 40 freelance working critics be part of this panel. And what's been very gratifying is I have often sat as an advisor to the panel to help them explain, is it the director who does the lighting? Of course it is. The director will tell you all those keystrokes to put into the desk. <laughs> Not the light play. But, but you know, what's projection and what's lighting? What's scenography and what's lighting? How does this happen? Why was it like this? So there's, there's usually a working lighting designer who's an advisor to the lunch and gets to have a nice lunch too. And that's all the only recompense that we get. And uh, to hear the conversations of the critics talking about people, talking about how they perceive lighting, how they talk about the shows that they've been seeing, and asking questions, it's really fantastic. And it has led over the years to a dramatic increase of those critics mentioning lighting in their work. It is the best ride we've ever thought of. Wow. You're educating the critics. Yeah. And that's educating all. the, that's, because yeah, educating the, the critics. critics, believe right. it or not, the critics think that they work in the theater too. Mm-hmm. Just like we do. Mm-hmm. We yeah. tend to want to put them as enemies or <laughs> champions when they like us. <laughs> but they, they have as much vested interest in our business as sure. we do. Yeah. And they want to know how things make are made. So we also, through the ALD, have run a couple of critic workshops nice. where we'll get seven or eight critics together, and we've taken like a, a white card model and said, this is what we're given. Here's some pictures of what we did. Yeah. To tell them the, the little bit of the, and the process. We have free yeah. range, you know, and it's great. It's beautiful. It's been very, very, it's always been fun, and we never un- should underestimate how our critics want to understand what we do and don't always have the tools to do it. You know, it's interesting because that model worked great in the UK. And we yeah. did the, the Knights of Illumination Awards twice in America, but it didn't work so well because A, the work is 3,000 miles apart. And Understood. there's no way for any one critic to see everything. Plus no. there were various categories by then. There was theater, there was opera, there was concert. So there was really, there hard really to do. aren't any... The music critics don't much look at lighting. And no. we found out that like at the New York Times, for example, and a lot of other major papers, their critics are not allowed to serve on any panels like that. We have come in for some criticism that our critics were too London-centric yeah, or too traditional. So we've been working and with the Profile Awards, which we've adopted that same system because we were very clear that that had immeasurable gains for right. us because... So you can't self-submit a show. It just has to be that somebody's seen it. Right. And our critics are seeing hundreds of shows between that panel of right. people. Right, but they see the them critics. all anyway, right? They're seeing them anyway. So we don't ever pay right. for anybody to go right. buy a ticket right. or pay for their travel. It's whatever they're seeing in the line of their professional work. And if they had and to, they could take a train to Manchester or Glyndebourn or someplace else. They will else. do, and some do. But again, we have the problem here is that the, the newspapers, the print media, which most of them work for, don't pay them the expenses and don't give them the word count anymore mm. to do a lot of that. So we have tried to expand our we've, – we've opened up our panel to include more regional critics okay. because we knew that we were missing a lot of work. And there still is a lot of excellent work that just is not seen. But mm-hmm. really proud of the Profile Awards. I think we've taken some of the stuff from the Knights of Illumination, which was a great model, and we've improved it a bit, particularly to get more visibility to more diverse work, not just the more major houses. Right. And we've celebrated stuff that happened on a really small scale in a village hall 
that somebody happened to catch and was really impressed by, stuff that's happened in a pub, some stuff that's happened at major international festivals and the major opera houses. So no more 50 pound swords, hand forged. No more 50 Toledo pounds. Spain. I always wanted one. You know, I always wanted to be a moil and I thought ah, that would be a oh great God. tool. Oh, that's you know? hilarious. Oh, David. That moil, no, would that I can moil. tell you that, yeah, I can tell you they're very blunt. Uh, right? <laughs> Not a clean cut. <laughs> Not a clean cut. My have, okay. I, mine is in Portugal where we oh. have a period, a period home that fits the sword. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. You mentioned earlier that you really like the hand draft and all that. And now anyone who's seen any one of your shows looks at that show and say, this is state of the art work. I mean, really using state of the art technology. Okay. Because, you know, you're, we're about the same age. Okay. Yeah. And I went through the same thing. When I started, I started as an assistant in 1980 and everything was done by hand, hand drafting, hand and paperwork, uh, you had to update it every night by hand. I mean, all that stuff, magic mm-hmm. sheets, repatch sheets, all that crap, right? And you and I have probably have seen the technology the same way over the years. And now we're going into a new era called AI, artificial right. intelligence, right? I'd settle for just some intelligence. <laughs> well, you're not going to find that in the United States. I'll tell you that right now. You're in the right place, at least. Okay, so how have you been able to keep up with all this technology? Because I must tell you, it's moving faster and faster and faster. Oh, it's so hard. Um, it's funny. Uh, I spent a half a day at Plaza just a month or so ago. And you go around and you see people. And you, you know, I mostly just talk to people I know. Uh, and sometimes I have a problem in the back of my head that I'm looking for something for people see lighting designers as specifiers. And I have very rarely specified anything in, I feel in my life, you know, there have been a few big shows where you'd think that we were able to get what we want, but that we tend to get what's on the shelf of the higher companies, unless we've got a big budget that encourages them to buy the latest toy that we really want. We get what's there. Uh, so I kind of wait for the technology to filter down into an area where I might be able to get it. Um, I am lucky that, and I've used this mercilessly through my 40 plus years in this industry and the people I've come to know by going to trade shows and by being involved in the charity and stuff like that. If I need something, I will call up and ask for it. And uh, I want to encourage even our young designers who are starting out to don't be afraid, even if you don't think you've got any money, don't be afraid to ask the manufacturers, the higher companies, whomever, you know, your local university who might have stuff sitting there on the floor to borrow stuff, try stuff out because the smart people will recognize that you're the future. That's right. And that they want your business and they want your contacts and they want your feedback. Of course, it's your obligation to use the stuff well and to return it immaculately on time. And rarely are we around for that process. But that's part of the incumbent thing about borrowing stuff. But I've been lucky and had people who have wanted their equipment to be on a project that I've been involved in because I get excited by it. I know that I don't have the budget for it. So I, I had borrowed stuff. You know, and I was in a position to be, to use some very lights for the first time, the first person to use very lights at the National Theater in Great Britain. And there was a budget meeting where it was discussion about, could we afford the very lights and the artisan that had to come with it? (laughs) And the technicians. (laughs) Yeah. And, or could we afford another set of costumes? The director decided to cut a set of costumes because she thought the very light technology at that time would help this show, which shifted from black and white to color. Guess what a moving light can do? You couldn't do any other way in those days. The theater had vetoed the idea of moving lights because it was interrupting their, what we would now call workflow, and it was slightly threatening to the some of the people who were in the administration of it. So the director of the theater, a visionary theater director, Richard Eyre, was at that budget meeting where he said, well, no, you don't have, you, have, you, you just don't have the money for it. So 
the second meeting happened when the director decided to cut a set of costumes. So now it's the black and white section. They can wear the black and white stuff they wore in Act 1, in Act 2. So uh, we got the very lights. Mm. <laughs> and, what uh, production was that? That was Lady in the Dark. Oh, yeah. Directed mm. by Francesca Zambello, yeah. an American opera director. Mm -hmm. who you, I'm sure we'll know the name. Designed by Adrian Lobel. Mm. Oh, nice. Mm. From America. And I was lucky enough to be able to light it. Beautiful. And we used a lot of VL 500s. <laughs> 500s. Were they, five they were fives hundreds? in those. They were B fives in those days. Oh, yeah. They were VL fives. Right. And Adrian Lobel had these sail-like structures that, mm -hmm. with the black and white scenes, needed to be a clean white. And then all of a sudden, you wanted them to go to color. And uh, it was great to play with that technology for the first time. I, I, you know, I've had great support from companies like that, and we weren't paying. Believe me, we were not paying list price. That happened to me once, way back when they had the VL twos. And uh, and I was friends with uh, Jim Waits from Verilite, and I was doing a show in Chautauqua. Remember, you know Chautauqua, yeah, West sure, I know of it. And uh, and I said, you know, we're doing this Don Giovanni, and I would love to use some VL twos. And they Verilite just gave them to us, you know, we, yeah. with a bunch of VL fives too. That because VL fives had just come out at the time, which are nice. The VL fives are really quiet, but the VL twos were very loud. Yeah, not but quiet. that, yeah. yeah. But that being said, Verilight was very supportive of that, and they've been, you know, over the years supportive of education. Where I know that Steve, he has a situation with Verilight that when I was at SMU, I had too, and they just donate so much stuff. Well, my first use of Verilight was for a play that was being produced by the Royal Court in a West End theater. And it was being, they were turning a West End theater, as is the Vogue still. You've got a really nice Victorian theater with a stage and an audience. But no, that's not good enough for this particular director. He had to build a stage in the middle of the auditorium in the orchestra and put people on the stage and turn it into the round so there were no rigging positions, there were no angles, as designed by those clever Victorians who knew how to make a theater work. And so in the limited places I could put a light, I thought I need a lot of functionality. And I had had lunch a few months prior with the brilliant industry person, Brian Croft, who for a while was running Berry Lights in the UK. Brian toured with the Rolling Stones. You know, basically, if, he's anywhere, if there was anywhere anything fun was happening, Brian was there. And he had said, look, Rick, if ever you think you need some of our lights, you know, don't worry about the money. Let me see what we can do. So I gave them my little conventional lighting hire budget. And not only did he give me half a dozen VL6s, which were appropriate for the job, he also gave me an artisan and the very brilliant Andy Baller to program. And I said, but you don't have money to pay. I said, don't worry. If you don't have Andy programming these lights, you'll get frustrated by them. You won't know how to use them. Your crew won't know how to use them. And you'll think that they're terrible and you'll never use them again. So I know that you need Andy. And that started out a very nice career of Andy and I working together until now he's way too famous and designs his own shows. <laughs> but, uh, but again, it's that sort of support that you get from this industry, if you just ask and approach people with a good spirit, people, you know, because we've all been there and they've been there too. I think it's, you know, I've been very lucky. It's so true. Very so lucky. It looks like we're kind of running out of time. We could talk to you for hours. You will have to come back again soon. Yeah, but I mean, some people will talk about lighting shows. Right. <laughs> but to ra wrap this up for today, what advice would you give young designers getting in the business today? The Rick um, Fisher wannabes. The wannabes, gosh. Um, I think take every opportunity, see as much stuff as you can. Get to talk to as many people as you can. Be around where the stuff that you like to do is happening. Be in the room. Yep. Get yourself in the room. It's the brilliant Dwayne Schuler, who you alluded to earlier, always says when we talk to students at the, the apprentices at Santa Fe, lighting is a contact sport, uh, <laughs> just like football. It's the people you know. It's your enthusiasm. And when you get those opportunities... Be there, be good, be easy to work with. Don't be about yourself, but be about the project mm -hmm. and be interested in what you're looking at, as opposed to expecting people to be interested in you. Right. 
Right. Because right. if you're interested in them, yeah, they'll be interested in you. In you. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. Because That's we all beautiful. work with a very small group of people. And we love to have other people be interested in what we're doing. And there aren't very many of them. So a little bit more company, a bit more fun company is welcome nine times out of ten. Right. And, you know, you have to be sensitive. You have to think, oh, this point, I'm going to fade into the woodwork because there's something very stressful going on down there. And the last thing I want is for my the person I'm observing to think that I'm observing them having a meltdown or getting difficult notes or getting right. chewed out. You know, right. there are times you, know, you need discretion. But be get involved as much as you can. That's very I good advice. I also want to put in a... Put in a show like plug while I think about sure, it. Another one of my sure. committees I'm on is show light, which is the which is kind of taking what you've been doing in 391 sessions of the Lumen Brothers and putting it in person for a conference that happens every four years. We did take a very long COVID break, but we're back. All right, and we'll be we'll be back in May 19th to the 22nd in Dijon in France. And we're looking for papers, for people to present papers. It is, imagine LDI with just the seminar series that Ellen does, the socializing that we all like, and none of that trade show bullshit. Well, there are <laughs> tabletops, aren't there? There are tabletops, but basically there are tabletops that are just a, a conversation point to help our sponsors, who are the companies, mm -hmm have something on their table to just start conversations, but it's about the people who are doing stuff with lighting all across the board. Showlight.org.uk, I think, is our website. I have to tell you that two of the most unforgettable events of my life, and I have been to 500,000 events, took place at various show lights. That dinner that Strand sponsored at Hoopton House in yep. Edinburgh was the most exceptional event I've ever been to, including yep. the retreat ceremony with the bagpipers. Yep. Oh my God. Wow. And then the dinner at that chateau in Florence, um, the, they always get one major sponsor to come up with a dinner for 300 people. And those are the most expensive sponsorships around, I can imagine. But extraordinary events and definitely worth the price of admission. And I will share with you that those companies, and we're very lucky we've got headline sponsorship from Robert Juliet this year. Which is great. Many other sponsors coming. They spend less on those dinners than they do probably on their stand at LDI or Plaza. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> there you go. So I have oh. a suggestion. You know, <laughs> I says, I'm going to be in Vegas France in Bay. Could Light Talk get on the schedule at show? Yes. I'm going to be in France in May also. Well, let's all yeah, we be in we, France in May yeah, and do Light Talk live. <laughs> I think what we need to do is ask you to maybe submit a paper idea to talk about what you've been doing, maybe to present an archive of what you've been, who knows? Well, like you've done with your organization, with ALPD, we stumbled yeah. into creating a community with Light Talk that we didn't know existed. Exactly. It's here. It is here, and we just need to do a little bit more work. I mean, what you're doing is brilliant. We uh, we had a, one of our members do something during the pandemic to try and train people in the UK on what it takes to be a good associate, a role that we don't have as much in the UK as you do in the United States. And that was very successful, and that spawned a whole lot of things. And there is an archive of stuff there. So Ellen will tell you that... Show light is the most fun you can possibly have in the lighting calendar. Yep. I think. We're working at being more international. We're going to have some more <laughs> French people speaking. We've got speakers, we hope, lined up from Australia, from the continent. Great. Uh, so we're working at being a bit more international. It was always organized by people who used to work in the UK, largely television people. Right, right. It's the spawning of it. So we get television people, we get events people, we get some architectural people, we get theater people, rock and roll people. Ken Billington always comes. It's everything we want our community to be for three days. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, you kind of think, gosh, I could do that next year. But it takes a lot of organizing. Right. Every year, I think. Yeah, tell me about it. We do uh, we do LDI every year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> the I know. organizing. Rick, are you going to the States anytime soon? Um, 
Yeah, my next American project. I was just at Bard yeah. in the summer doing something at Summerscape, uh, which is always an interesting experience, but it was good in the end where they do buried treasured operas that you often wonder why they've been dug up. Right. But, uh, <laughs> Keep them down. But, absolutely. But my next one, I think, is going to be Chicago oh. in March. Okay. A musical I did in London called Sunny Afternoon, which is a bio show of the Kinks, mm. the band The Kinks. Ooh, I love oh. the Kinks thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. And that's going to be at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Oh, cool. Wow. Very good. And uh, again, part of the Lola. design is trying, absolutely, trying to lo light Lola with real park hair. Lola. <laughs> and you still get real park love hair. Love Lola. Song. Lola is <laughs> the best song. Well, Rick, thanks again. We will see you in France. Hopefully we see you before that. And can we have part two of this interview? Because we want to talk about Billy Elliot. We want to talk about the inspector calls. I mean, there's so yeah, much. The inspector's back on at the moment. Amazingly. Oh, where? If we are on in London. We're finishing. We're just finishing a four-week run in London at a unusual theater called the Alexandra Palace Theater, mm. which is uh, in a big old crazy building that was built in the Victorian era. Um, that's where ABTT holds their trade show. And they have a theater that's kind of been Peter Brooked, if you know what I mean. It's Peter like Brooked. Harvey. Distressed. It's been right. Right. Ar right. Arrested, <laughs> arrested decay, right. I think they call it. Right. And, we call it uh, distressed at the Harvey. Distressed. Uh. Well, we have done an installation there where it's been very successful for four weeks. And it starts another tour, UK tour. Um, we will be on the road for the best part of nine months. It tours during the academic years because they teach the play in the UK. That's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is we've outlived a lot of the lighting equipment that was originally on the show. I bet. <laughs> so <laughs> we now have. have nine universes on a show that had nothing moving. Nine <laughs> universes on the inspector calls. Okay. <laughs> We'd like so to that's see a that whole plot. other conversation. About how <laughs> things are dealt. We have moving lights that we don't move. <laughs> Well, right. well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but we remotely focused them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's labor-saving now. There you go. Wow. Well, so thanks again, Rick. And we'll we'll see you soon. And uh, good luck on your next project. Great. Thank you. Thanks for me including this. And well done on doing all this. Oh, thank you so much. Great to see you all. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again, you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you should make the unfortunate decision to litigate us, the Snoop Group with the legal team of Watson, Leitner, and Beam will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister, coming to you from Long Beach, St. Barts, Gainesville, and London, England. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. Thank you again, Rick. It's great to see you again. Yeah, great part Thank one. Got to do for us. And we will Thank see you. you all next Saturday morning. Bye bye from Light Talk. Bye bye. Adios.